call to order. The first item on the agenda, it's adjustments to agenda. Do any board members have adjustments? Agenda? No? Seeing none. The next item is approval of school board minutes and the first minutes of the regular school board meeting of Tuesday, August 10th, 1993. Any corrections? Rosemary? Um, I would just like to um, point out uh, probably a typo in uh, page 4B, item 2, 7th should be changed to 8th. It's not a substantial change. Anything else? Okay, the minutes stand approved as corrected. Uh, the next minutes are the special school board meeting of Tuesday, August 17th, 1993. Any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved. The next item is comments by the high school representative. Hi, my name is Matt Wright and I'm a junior at the high school. I'm here representing the student advisory council at the high school. Um, I guess for the next year or so, I'll be communicating ideas between the school board and the SAC. Um, for the past week, we have been settling into the school routine. Everything seems to be going fine. Um, I've talked to a number of students to get their reactions on the schedule. Um, as you know, there's been a change, and most of them have seen it as a positive change. They found it a little awkward at first, but they like it fine. Teachers also like the extra 10-minute blocks because it gives them more space and more time to relax, and they didn't feel as pressed. Um, in other news, the seniors had their dance last Friday night. Um, people had a good time, and that's about it for now. Thank you. Okay. Matt, I was just wondering, how are the students doing with no bells? Um, I think it's, it's been working fine. In the classes I've been in, uh, there haven't been too many people late or uh, complaining, because they start either right on the hour or five minutes after the hour. Great. And students haven't been, well, teachers haven't been going much past the five minutes. Um, it's kind of nice not to have that interruption of the bell sort of breaks <laughs> whatever's going on. Great, thank you. Anything else? Tell us about the, the message board. Oh, the message board. Um, it, it's a good idea because we don't have the interruptions of the uh, intercom sort of going off during the day. The only problem is that uh, it's kind of like a one-line scrolling thing and if there are a lot of announcements it takes about five minutes to get through the whole thing. So if you catch the tail end, you kind of have to sit in the cafeteria <laughs> and wait for it to go by for the next five minutes. But it's a good idea, and it seems to be working out fine. Anything else? Right, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Matt. Um, I don't believe we have middle school representatives here tonight. They have not been elected yet. Is that yes, ma'am. Correct? Next month. Okay. The next item is communications. I'll turn it over to Connie. Actually, I don't have any at the moment. Okay. Any from any other board members? No? Okay. The next item is superintendent's report, and I'll turn it over to Connie again. Thank you. Um, the um, opening of school, uh, which is our first item, uh, actually people have told me in just about every building that it has been fairly smooth. Um, there certainly have been some issues, and as I think in one of the buildings today, somebody said, well, I guess the honeymoon is over. It's the second week of school, so we have a few problems occurring. Uh, but I do think that the, uh, in comparison to last year, when we made a lot of uh, actual classroom changes, had the kindergarten to settle in, bus route changes, and so forth, seem, frankly, things do seem to be pretty smooth. Obviously, uh, an issue that, that I want to spend a little more time talking about, the building committee, um, later in the agenda uh, is sort of an overwhelming issue, but um, uh, I, we didn't really see any huge surprises. No classes changed dramatically from what our projections were, and we seem to have space for everybody, so so far so good. Um, if you want to hear, I did include the enrollment in your packet, um, which does not break out into individual class sizes in the Particularly, I, don't, I know there were some questions about that at the elementary, and I think Beth is prepared to fill you in on that. But I do want to point out that we are now at 1702, which means that the uh, 
Actually, I would have to go back into the records, but I do know that the enrollment did drop down to the 1500s a few years ago. Uh, the peak enrollment somewhere around 2300 in the 70s. Uh, so this is somewhere in between. Um, obviously, we're paying a lot of attention to enrollments and projections uh, because of talk about buildings and so forth, but um, this is right about where we had predicted it. The change is almost totally due to the difference between last year's graduating class and this year's kindergarten. That a difference between 1628 last year's enrollment and the 1702 is the difference between a class of 88 graduating and a kindergarten class of 166. So if you look at the enrollment patterns, you will see that the current seventh grade is at 156 at some time, and as that's been moving up through the grades, that has exceeded 160. So we now have two grades in the vicinity of 160. Um, if the pattern continues similar to the one uh, following the seventh grade, there will be a drop, and at least three of the grades are fairly dramatic drop which will uh, maintain the pattern of some increases over the years previous, but enough for us to balance out the use of space. We see nothing in this that is um, going to disturb our projections as far as the building project is concerned, mainly what I'm trying to point out to you. Obviously, if we have, for the next three years, we continue to see 170 or 160 in the kindergarten, we begin to have some more concerns, but I, I did notice <coughs> Uh, if any of you have it or have seen this in some detail, I would love to uh, get that. I understand that the birth rate has dropped for the first time in years. Um, did somebody see that report? Except for among teenage pregnancies, uh, which is, I think, a very significant trend to keep an eye on because, in fact, that will probably be the turn. Uh, we've been seeing the shadow of the baby boom generation for the last eight years, and at some point, it's predictable we're going to see the shadow of the uh, declining enrollment years. And uh, that's going to be, I mean, it's a very important thing for schools to look at from the standpoint of building because, in fact, uh, the 70s caught a lot of school districts flat-footed. They simply were not prepared for the dramatic downturn in, in uh, the birth rate. So just for what it's worth, it's editorial comment. And if you care to know more about individual class sizes, you can the principals are prepared to address that. Well, I think because it is an issue of concern to a lot of parents, it probably would be a good idea just to hear it, hear it officially. As Connie mentioned, the, um, the largest class is the kindergarten class at 166, and the individual class sizes there, there's one class with 20, three classes of 19, four with 18, and one class with 17. And then the next largest class is a third grade, um, and there are three classes there with 22 children and four classes with 21. Um, kind of hopping around here. Um, first grade and second grade both have 125, and uh, those class sizes, there's one at 16 in first grade, two at 17, one at 18, and three at 19. That's at first grade. And second grade, also with a total enrollment of 125, there's six classes at 18 and one class at 17. And the fourth grade classes, there are five sections, and they're all pretty good size. There are three at 24 and two at 23 at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Any questions? I have one from the high school principal. The senior class dropped seven from last year. Yeah, Are these students that moved out of the system? Or? There was some that moved out of the system. We also had two students that from the private school. But the majority moved out of the system. Okay. I would uh, also put on my report uh, just an update on total quality meetings. These are ongoing. One of the probably major focuses for us right now is to establish a written handbook that will spell out exactly how all of our support services work. Um, again, it's we've been working on this for two years. You'd think we could just sit down and kind of write that up without any difficulty. We are inventing a new system. 
we are inventing a way by which we can not only put on paper but make it work how we process um, things that we call minor maintenance from major maintenance and uh, who is responsible for assigning what work to whom and so on. Um, this is much harder than it sounds and it's a job that requires us to be very specific about tasks as well as general responsibilities in job description so that um, I think it's a useful activity and an ongoing one. We also have made plans to start involving the teachers. We are finding some difficulty with that because of the pressure of opening school and teachers getting their classes settled. It's very difficult for them to find the time just to do another activity. So we're finding ways to incorporate into their regular team planning time and we have some specific uh, targets for that. Other than that, moving on. Any questions? Okay. The third thing under my report is the athletic report, and we have, uh, of course, both the high school administration and Keith Weatherby, the athletic director here, to answer questions. I did include Keith's um, report for you for the year just finished, the 1992-93. Um, I think you've had a chance, of course, in your packet to read that. Do you have any questions um, or comments? He's here to answer. Um, I would like to know what the duties of the assistant athletic director are and about the number of hours that he's required. I did find out what he was paid, so I asked the business manager. Uh, the assistant athletic director is actually the person uh, who helps me in the middle school handling the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities of the uh, 7th and 8th grade in their different athletic programs. So do you know, have any idea what number of hours he puts in, what, how his, what his salary is based on? Yeah, I think it's based upon uh, 330. Why which is the uh, athletic fee committee came up with, I don't know, three or four years ago. Okay, the house manager, that's Mr. Boothby? That's the person that helps in the high school with uh, timing at games, getting workers at basketball games, <laughs> soccer games, field hockey games, uh, taking care of uh, some of the field issues for home games. Okay, the only suggestion I would make, it's, it's excellent what you've done for us in, in your um, financial report. What I would do is to include the athletic director's salary and the assistant athletic director's salary because I feel those are part of our... Isn't the assistance in there? No, I don't think... I could, well, because that's actually part of the middle school, but maybe it isn't, and uh, and I think mine has always been always been before in the budget item as under administration, but I can do whatever you like. So what you give us is essentially the high school athletic. Right. This is all the high school athletics, I, yeah. You know, I really, I really think as a, as a total athletic package, we should know what it's costing us for the middle school. What it's costing us totally for athletics. Okay. I mean, I know the budget comes under the middle school, but I'm, I believe you must have some say in what, what coaches are hired, yeah. et cetera. I mean, you're the one that brings forth those, uh, rec those recommendations and nominations. You know, it would be interesting to see what, what are total athletic packages for the whole school system. Again, looking at a system-wide approach. Okay. Mark? Just a comment, really. Just reviewing the numbers on student participation in athletics and with your cover letter describing that the primary intent of the athletic system at Cape Elizabeth High School is participation and not state championships and the championships will take care of themselves. I, I think that approach is exemplary. I believe it's accurately reflected by the students' participation and it's simply the amount of enthusiasm and cooperation among students and coaches that provide such an outstanding experience. Having 74% uh, of students involved in the athletic program I think is just spectacular. Just wanted to thank you for that. Do we know what our participation rate is in, in the middle school? I think or it's higher than that. I don't know, but I, I know in talking with Andy, I think it's 
what it has been in the past. For the whole year. That would be also. I can try to find out to you, but I know when talking with uh, with Andy Strout, that I, up over eighty percent. But I can find out. It would be interesting if he could give us the same kind of report that you give. You know, a breakdown of the cost, the number of kids per sport, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't need to look at the wins and losses because we should essentially view middle school as a learning experience, I not agree. so much a a win lose. Rosemary, thank you, Keith. I was just wondering how year two of the contracts was going, with the teams basically having. Uh, more say than in prior years of what the conditions of the athletic contract are? Um, I would say that we made some progress in some areas that we were disappointed in last year. Uh, a nice way of putting it, I might say. Um, I would say that it's, it's basically the same. I mean, as I mentioned here, and, and sometime I, I would like to sit down with all of you and really, and I know Rick and I both discuss this whole issue. Um, I don't know if we're ahead of where we were in the past. I don't think we're behind where we were in the past. And uh, I don't know what the magic formula is, to be honest with you. And I don't think any of the other schools around know what it is as well. I mean, we're all kind of searching for what might be best, whatever we can do to try to help as many kids as we can. Do you think the students are more aware of consequences now? Are, are they actively involved in the process? I think they're aware of them, yes. I, I know it doesn't scare them off, yeah. but they're aware. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, at an earlier meeting uh, for students or parents of students participating in athletics that you had contacted several other athletic directors and that the Ten different schools in the area. Right. And had heard from eight of them. They, the one outlier was the group that felt that they really had this under control, which would surprise me certainly. Um, to, I would be very much impressed if they actually did have it under control or felt that, it, it, that their system was working very well. Did you by any chance talk with them? Was there something unique about their approach to it that sounded as no, though there might be No, I think that they probably had it? a better handle on it than any place else because it was a private school. And oh. the kids may have stayed right there on campus in dorms. And uh, that kind of helped them get a better handle on it than the rest of it. <laughs> so, that, I guess that but it, but answers it, it, the if question. You take, yeah, if you take the different uh, public schools that I contact in the area, uh, there wasn't a single school that felt that uh, what they were doing was effective. Do you see anything we can do as a board to help you with that job? Ah, uh, good question. Good <laughs> um, well, I see, I see some because I see at least four parents here who have uh, kids that are in high school right now. I mean, as I said in there, and, I, and, and Rick and I have talked about it, and at the meeting that we had that fall uh, meeting with the parents, you know, we talked with the parents, and, and we're really trying to come up with something uh, where the parents, we hope, can work with us to try to help the kids because hey, we, we care about what happens to the kids and we're there to try to help them and, and to, we're willing to do whatever we can to try to help these kids through what is a very difficult trying time for them and, uh, and we're hoping that the parents will be willing to work with us and help us through this process. It seems to me that, um, you know, from what you hear with the rumor mill and, and all that this problem extends below the high school and into the middle school. Is there something we should be doing at the middle school on this subject, do you think? Mm, Is it too late to wait for high school to? I think probably the, you know, the process should begin in the middle school and and, and uh, I mean, education is, is the beginning of the process down there, and, I, and I'm sure that it's part of the educational process. I mean, hey, talking with kids, they tell us we know everything already. You don't need to tell us what we don't know, because we know it all. But then they have to decide for themselves what they're going to do. I don't know. I'm just thinking off the yeah. top of my head, but it just seems to me if there were consequences when they first got into sports, maybe. There are. You know, maybe. There are in the middle school. There are? Okay. Yeah. There's something like a contract. Yeah. My oldest is in fifth grade, so I haven't reached this point yet. But a couple of years, yeah. you'll be there. I <laughs> <laughs> can hardly wait, Peter. 
Could you elaborate uh, on uh, some of the things you mean when you say uh, the parents uh, could work with you more? Well, I guess sometimes uh, we get the feeling that maybe they aren't exactly honest with us and uh, what might go on in some issues. You know, for example, we had a, there was a dance last weekend, and I'm sure there were a lot of extracurricular activities that went on with the dance other than what we know about already and have acted on. And uh, I have no idea if anything was done about it at all. I know that nobody called the school to tell us anything about any of the kids that might have been involved in something, even though there's a, there's a contract that they've agreed to. That's a good example. So, I mean, that's the type of issue that, that we're involved with. All well, the I uh, happened to be there at 11 o'clock uh, and uh, was talking to the officer on duty, and I gather that some things were written up. That's all I know. Yeah. Um, so some things uh, went into some sort of semi, uh, no, I guess totally official process. Is that correct? Yeah, I beg your pardon? At the I'm dance. Anyway. At yeah, the no, dance. We had four athletes who suffered consequences because of the, the police found out about, or, or, and along with Rick and Randy who were there also. Mm -hmm. But that's all we know about, you know, three or four hundred kids, only four. And you know about that because it was on school grounds? We know about it because it was on school grounds, exactly right. This certainly is a dilemma. I, I just, I wish, I wish we could just take it one step farther. I don't know what that step is, but it just seems like, you know, nothing that's been tried so far has really been effective. And I agree with you that, you know, it goes back basically to the family situation. If the family situation isn't going to deal with it, it's awful hard for the school too, and there's a limit um, to what the school should do. But um, I think we should continue talking. No, we absolutely. Back and forth about this. Um, I, I can. I mean, I can tell you that you know, from our point of view, at the high school, that we're not giving up. We'll keep on trying. Anything else, Charles? I think the thing that I know the drinking and the drug scene, but I think what really starting to alarm me, and from my observation this summer, is a is a parent of a high school student who was out a lot and seeing other high school <laughs> students is the increase in smoking, cigarette smoking. I mean, it really is, it's unbelievable the number of ch students that are smoking. And these are, some of these are athletes. I'm sure they are. And I agree this Lyman it goes back as I mentioned before, the education issue. These kids, we all know, you know, the harms of smoking and what it can do to you and so forth. I mean, it's documented all the time. And these children, as, as, as elementary students, I mean, would lecture their parents. You know, couldn't be around smoking. Would, you know, have all kinds of adverse comments to make. And just, what has suddenly changed? Because, because this, is a, this is a phenomenon that's just starting to increase quite rapidly. Probably a cycle thing, but it just it just mm. it boggles my mind. But I agree. There's so much so much education out there about smoking, and so much scientific data to prove what it does to you, and yet they've closed their minds to it. And as I said, they know all that data. They really do. I mean, I think the school does a fine job with that. And I mean, we're all touched by somebody who has had cancer or died of cancer or, or had a heart attack or died of a heart attack. And it just, I just wonder what has changed. And I, it's probably I'm sorry, I don't have the answer. No, I'm sure. <laughs> and, I think, and, I, and I agree. The whole problem stems from, from the family and how aware the family are making the school and other agencies aware. Mm -hmm. I agree with Ann, it's, it's a family problem. But it extends into the schools. Yeah. Well, 
let's keep communicating about it anyway. You bet. So. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. The next item is school board subcommittees and reports, and first on the list is finance subcommittee, which I know has been postponed because most of the board members had uh, a barbecue to go to with their freshman high school kids tonight. We, d we did that, and uh, this uh, report uh, will not be as difficult or as, uh, a problem uh, as the one we just dealt with. Uh, in fact, there is no report uh, because we didn't meet. Uh, we do, however, have a uh, an interesting agenda for the Finance Committee meeting, and so I'd like to use this time to uh, find out when my colleagues could meet and uh, discuss some of these issues. And one of the alternatives would be to uh, do it at the end of this meeting if we ever end a school board meeting at a reasonable hour. Uh, does that uh, appeal to anybody and just get it out of the way? Uh, and would this uh, constitute sufficient public notice? Uh, do we need to give public notice? Well, you already gave public notice for it preceding the meeting, and I, uh, it's not our intent to be uh, devious about it. We do have an executive session scheduled at the end of the meeting, um, but I don't see any reason why you can't uh, cover those, get the report from the business manager. It's a sort of interim thing. Just do it after the before. Why not? Okay, I, I don't either. Uh, and uh, in any event, uh, nobody turned up at uh, 6.30, to my knowledge, to find an empty room. Is that correct, yeah. Connie? Uh, well, I wasn't Scott, uh, I don't know. <laughs> The room we was were, empty. We were, we were here, barbecue. so. Any, anyway, it was a terrific barbecue, and I want to thank all those people who were involved in it. Some of them are here tonight, cooks, and uh, I left the, they left the bottle washers down there, I guess, uh, probably cleaning up right now. but. Uh, it was a nice event, the, uh, you know, and the first one, I gather, for the incoming freshmen, teachers, families, and uh, it was terrific. Thank you. That's the Finance Committee <laughs> report. No, Charlie wants to add something about I, it. I would make a recommendation. Are we live as far as the television? Mm -hmm. He might want to list what the agenda is, so in case there's someone out there listening that had some interest. The agenda of the Finance Committee yes. meeting? Just so All right, it'll probably be around 11.15 tonight. <laughs> for, uh, we, we never do list the agenda, so I don't have an agenda, but I will look at uh, Scott's uh, comments. Uh, we have some uh, requests for uh, appropriations, uh, or at least changing in, in uh, hours worked, uh, certain employees. Uh, we have, uh, and this is perhaps the major issue, uh, we want to uh, discuss the proposal for school management software in the high school. Uh, on top of that, of course, we go over the, uh, you know, the latest computer printouts and warrants. Okay, we'll move on to the policy subcommittee. Rosemary? Yes. We met on uh, September 8th, and there is a memorandum with a review of the policy subcommittee meeting in which we, re we reviewed section I, and we are requesting that certain actions be taken. Um, should I read what the policy is, state what it is and what the action is, or? Um, at this point, what we're experimenting with a, a format we haven't used before. Uh, I think basically I would just, uh, since I was the one that sort of devised it, if you want, I will explain what my rationale behind it was. Thank you, and, and I agree with the report, by the way. Okay. Um, one of the things we wanted to do, and we said as a task for the year, obviously, is to finish our review of the policy manual, uh, so that on our meeting, what we did was to go over those readings that seemed fairly non-problematic and put them on for a first reading today, and they're noted in bold print, and we will put those under the, there are three of them, uh, under the uh, appropriate place under new business. In addition, we noted a number of issues that I will be referring to administration. Some of them are administrative guidelines rather than board level policies, but they're kind of interesting, and they are important issues, and people, as we went through them, noted some um, puzzlement as to uh, whether or not these administrative policies are even close to our actual practice. For instance, we looked at homework um, uh, without going back to the buildings and asking whether 
um, these were remotely close to what the guidelines were now obviously I can't address that so we pulled those out noted that they are going to the administration for review and update and they will get, be getting back to us um, and uh, I think that's basically the summary we will continue to march through our, our uh, policy book doing the easy ones the things that require very little bit of um, review getting to the end of it and then spending as much time as needed to separate out some of the more um, difficult or problematic issues. Okay. Um, do you want to just note is the next meeting still on Wednesday, October 6th? Where is your room? Okay. At 9 to 11 in Superintendent's mm -hmm. conference room. Okay. Okay. The next item is the building committee. I'll turn it over to Tony. Well, I would like to um, take this opportunity just to thank everybody who's been involved uh, and to particularly thank the town council for their vote last night for putting out the project to referendum. Uh, I guess I'm reaching a point where I feel like I'm eating, breathing, sleeping, dreaming this project and I feel like every time I talk about it I'm saying the same thing I said yesterday. On the other hand, uh, what I want to point out is that in going to parents groups as well as working with the building committee and working with this group, the school board, it is very obvious that there is a building citizen support for getting information out to the community, for doing anything and everything we can in the next few weeks to help people understand what the true dimension of the problem is. Um, I am going to take somewhat unusual step tonight, and I don't know if this is going to come in the camera, but one of the issues that is very troubling to me are the safety issues. Um, we have buildings that are 30 to 60 years old. There have been numerous attempts over the years to do ordinary maintenance, and there may well have been times when maintenance wasn't done as well as it might have been. I am satisfied that in the last two years we've made some extraordinary efforts to get a handle on that. but. The deterioration is so pervasive that it is almost impossible for us to predict where the next accident is going to occur and what it will be and how we can prevent it. And I thought I would bring in to show the board as well as anybody here what happened today. I have you. Can you get this in the camera? I hold this up. Maybe Charlie, you can help me. This is a plastic covering before it fell and broke was roughly like this. No, I guess it goes the other way. And it's the kind of thing that 30 years ago is, a, was, is put up as a fixture onto um, a shield fluorescent tubing. Uh, the lawn building is full of these. Some of them have deteriorated and disappeared. They are no longer available in this form. Uh, there are some newer models, but they're hard to come by. Uh, we, these, by the way, have been cleaned. They, <clears throat> we had a very thorough cleaning program in that building this summer. But one of the things that happens with this particular model is that it dries out, it cracks, and without any warning, it can just shatter. I mean, if you look up at them, you will see that there are cracks, and they also are very hard to secure in an absolutely safe fashion because of the way those fixtures are made. Today in a second grade classroom, and I talked to the teacher shortly after this occurred, and I have to tell you she was shaking. And she said to me, by the grace of God, I didn't do what I normally do. She said, I usually have the children line up by my desk and come in this way with their papers. And for some reason, she said, I do not know why. I, in fact, asked the children to sit at their desks and not to come up. And she went over to their desk. At that particular moment, this fell. It shattered. You can see the points. There would have been a child under it, but there wasn't. There's no way we could predict that that was going to happen. What I did do was to get our maintenance director over there. I asked him to immediately take steps to get whatever kind of help we had to get in there to go through that building to remove the, all of those covers. Removing them is not enough because that lays bare the fluorescent tubes. We do have sleeves available to put over those fluorescent tubes because it is a risk that if you don't put some kind of covering over them, 
they may shatter. And so we have immediately engaged a safety program to deal with this problem. But I want you to know the teacher was shaking, the children were frightened, and other teachers in, say, in the same spaces were very concerned, to say nothing of all the rest of us. This is not the first time that a light fixture has fallen, both in that building and in the middle school. And these are large buildings with old, worn out, antiquated interiors, heating systems, lighting systems. They must be replaced. I hope the community will support that referendum. Thank you. Um, and I was just wondering if um, now would be an appropriate time for Connie to mention again the, the two tours that are remaining. Uh, because I know it's been written, but yeah. some people are auditory. Yes, this Saturday morning, beginning at 10. It does take about two hours to go through the two buildings. We do try, uh, the administration, whoever's available, myself, um, do try to stop and answer questions to point out various issues. I will certainly point out this particular issue to people on Saturday. Um, there are a few others I point out. Um, we did the first one this past Saturday. We had a fairly small group, and most of the people, frankly, who were there were people who had been through the building and who were there in support, but there were some who perhaps had been through either as parents or community people who came to ask questions. I think that um, it is, I'm finding it extraordinarily difficult to have people understand uh, the scope of the problem. I mean, it's the kind of thing that sounds like you ought to be able to do a little patch up, fix up, you know, how can you possibly spend $11.7 million on uh, putting in light fixtures? Well, obviously, it's not just light fixtures. And it does take two hours to even begin to get a handle on the dimension of the problem and why it is so widespread and why those are old and tired buildings, but they, we cannot really afford to bulldoze them and start all over again. There are all kinds of interconnected issues here. I thought some of the comments at last night's public hearing uh, were, were absolutely on target, that it is, in fact, everything is connected to everything else, um, and it's, it's impossible to do one small piece. The community, of course, has been band-aiding. The, the roof pieces were band-aids. So various other things that have gone on are band-aids, and um, at some point, I've been asked repeatedly to put a dollar figure. I will clearly report back to the board next month exactly what it's costing us to replace those in man hours as well as material. Uh, I cannot put a dollar figure on the beer. And I think that I, I do not want to panic parents. I do not want to panic teachers. And I do not, I do not yet see the conditions so bad that they are totally out of control. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you about things like that. Uh, also, I did not watch the town council meeting. I'm sorry I was absent. I had another commitment. Uh, was there any discussion as to what would happen if the render referendum failed? We did mention, it's certainly my belief, that there is no alternative. If the referendum fails, we'll be back in May. If it fails in May, we'll be back in November. And it is not going to change much. It is conceivable that um, there could be some shaving of some things here and there. Uh, but a very, very good building committee with two different, two of the best architectural firms as far as school buildings are concerned in the area have spent three years sorting this issue out. I do not see how we can have a much more cost-effective plan than what we have uh, and still take care of the problems. Um, and frankly, it's a moment of truth for this little town. I mean, it's that serious. These are buildings that cannot be inhabited for many more years without major work. The question is, do you want to continue to patch up with uh, light? I don't know if the light fixture is going to fall down next. I, mean, I don't know those things. Peter? Well, I, I think a number of things were said about uh, the what would happen if it didn't pass. Uh, and I was at the meeting, but I didn't speak. But one theme that uh, was uh, mentioned two or three times was that if this does not pass, that we will end up paying as much, probably more, in the decline in our real estate values than we would pay if our taxes went up. And the reason for that, I remember one speaker said, is that 
people who come to look at the schools in Cape Elizabeth will see the deplorable state of these schools. They will, the word will get around, it already is getting around, I'm sure, that these schools must be replaced. There really is no rational alternative. And so uh, we will suffer if we don't do this. And that was a very, you know, I, I can't remember how many speakers said that, but it was four or five, uh, you know, really starkly stated that, that economic price that we would pay if we don't do this. Now, I think, frankly, that's not a big deal compared to the safety issue that we just heard about. And, and, and safety, incidentally, was mentioned, too. And, you know, come to think of it, uh, uh, I will not soon forget standing uh, before uh, most of you a few years ago and uh, awarding a plaque to an engineer who happened to catch a fatal flaw in one of our patch, patch, patch procedures, which, had he not caught it, probably would have resulted in a very serious accident. So safety is an obvious theme that we heard a lot about last night. Yeah, I think the, the most uh, chilling comment that was made, um, and certainly in light of seeing this the very next day, was <clears throat> the woman who said, how will we feel if something happens to one of our kids? And um, unfortunately, we come perilously close, I think. Um, I, d I would like to uh, mention a few other opportunities for people to get information that are set right now or to um, tour the buildings. And one is at the uh, Pond Cove Fair, uh, which is going to happen on Sunday, September 26th from 11 to 3, or 11.30 to 3.30. Um, there will be tours offered. There will be information there um, uh, for people to pick up. Um, also, tomorrow night at the Community Services sign up. Uh, we will hopefully have the model there, the site plans, um, information, and some people who can answer questions. Um, and the Middle School Parents Association has scheduled a meeting um, for us to come talk to them about the building issue. Um, it's October 14th at 7 o'clock, and, and middle school parents will certainly be receiving more information about that. But they've also graciously invited middle school parents to bring others, bring neighbors, bring whoever they can get interested to come to that meeting. So those are some things that are set right now. I would just like to make a comment mm -hmm. on, on a reality. And a reality in this community is we're giving tours of the middle school in Pond Cove. I think people should also take a tour of the high school and see the disparity of what we allow 400 students to inhabit, which seem to be relatively safe, spacious environment and where we subject 1,300 of our smaller students to uninhabitable, unsafe conditions. And I think, I think this community needs to get out, not just look at those two schools, but look at the disparity in what we have in this system. Um, I can remember coming on the school board four years ago, and I had, my only exposure to this system was essentially the middle school and the elementary. The only exposure to the high school had been the gymnasium, the pool and the auditorium. And I was awestruck when I took a tour after I was elected of the high school. I just could not believe the difference in this system. And in that first year I was on the board is when we had our, our um, roof fiasco. And a year after I came on the board, Connie Goldman came on board and we had, due to the town council, initiated a school space study committee so this is an ongoing study for the last three years. And I really took a lot of issue to some of the comments last night by people who felt they were uninformed about what was going on. And I believe out of two reports that have come out of the last three years of extensive studies of these facilities, that people are still in the dark. And for an educated community that supports education, that really appalls me. Well, I was just going to say, I, I certainly know that there are a lot of good people who are working on getting flyers, getting out there, talking to people. Um, I just hope we can get enough people's attention. Did you want to say something? Oh, I, I wanted to echo what, what Charlie was saying, and uh, 
Uh, as my son passed on to the uh, the ninth grade uh, this year, uh, and and his friends, uh, you know, were around my house. So the comments about that disparity were really, uh, you know, quite. They were they were blown away. They they thought that they didn't know there was a, a, a nirvana out there. Well, it's not exactly nirvana, but it's a pretty run-of-the-mill high school. But what they've been accustomed to made it look like one. And, and I uh, must say, with my five years on the school board, I think I've had the opportunity, one way or another, to visit every school in Greater Portland. And if I were moving here, as one of the speakers suggested last night, and looking around, uh, I think this, the contrast would be very startling. And in spite of our fine reputation uh, for education in this community, I don't think we'll be able to sustain it for another decade if we don't replace these buildings, because we simply don't measure up to our surrounding communities, to our competitors, in effect. And I really think we really aren't replacing the buildings. We're doing extensive renovation with some new construction. And, I, and again, there was another issue that was brought up last night about the, the, the D-wing, the famous D-wing. And I think there's a misconception out there that if you take away the window walls and if you have to shore up the, the structure itself to put a brand new roof on, you're talking more than what it would cost for new construction. And, and the choice made by the um, building committee to tear that facility down, those were the considerations we, we discussed and the different alternatives. I mean, we came up, there must have been, we were up to what, F? Or the oh, number of plans beyond, the beyond that. G, I am the number I of think it's more like G or G. G. <laughs> so we were up to that number of different options before before we finally settled on the one that we did and and we really look for the most cost efficient ways of dealing with our problems and we looked for common solutions uh, in new construction things that could be shared by both schools so that's where the connector one came so we could share a cafeteria so that we could create a gym that could be used for swing space for, for either school. Um, I, I, I think it was a very, somebody asked was that waiting for a conservative uh, member of the building committee to comment. I think every member on that building committee was very conservative in, in the options that came out. They were very cost conscious. I think if you read through the minutes, which are in the report, which is at the library to be yes. signed out, yes. um, you can see that there is a constant theme, not only of trying to look under every single rock and trying to anticipate every single question, but that constant uh, feeling of responsibility not to spend too much money, to spend what we need to spend uh, to do a responsible job, but not to overspend. There was nobody interested in in overspending. Um, the other thing I'd just like to add to what uh, Charlie said about the common space, we were not only looking at uh, creating common space where we could have some cost efficiency, but we tried to make that very um, community friendly space, very accessible to the community uh, for performances for gym space. You know, it's right at the front of the building where it would be very accessible to the community, so that was a big consideration also. So this is going to sound flip, but I don't mean it that way. Um, if uh, Rick DeFusco and his high school staff could put a barbecue on for the kindergarten students like they did for the freshmen tonight, except put it in the middle school parking lot and make the parents eat in the middle school cafeteria, and if we did that for each grade for, from now until the referendum, people would know. And so if people aren't coming to the free walking tours, uh, perhaps we should add a little incentive to get people there because it, they really will understand the problem when they see it. You know, that really is, is part of our problem. Uh, you know, you've touched on it and uh, several of you have touched on it. Is how do we get the message of the reality out there? I mean, how do you do that? 
Uh, we, we have spent... Uh, <laughs> you know, work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you, you think of the figure that Connie flashed up at the hearing that showed that the cost of the high school in 1970, in, in dollars adjusted to 1993, is about the same as this project. Yet this project is going to accommodate twice as many students. Now, that's not a gold-plated Cadillac. That's not a Cadillac. That's not gold-plated. That's a Chevy with a standard shift. But how do you get people to find that out the way we have found that out? I like your idea. I'll go to that picnic, too. <laughs> Rick, you have your orders. Delegate. <laughs> Well, I think I, I feel like on? I'm perseverating on sure. this topic. Okay. I, I thought that was the last on. item on the agenda. No. no. <laughs> um, the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. The, no. your, your Do you have anything else to? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you got something, but uh, we'll move on to the ADA 504 committee. And okay. That is that? Uh, should be meeting tomorrow, um, and basically that will be an opportunity for staff to report to the rest of that committee what has been accomplished this summer so far you will recall a part of the budget process was drawing up a list of uh, projects uh, to, uh, some of them you can see as you enter the buildings at the high school and also at the middle school there have been some ramps and lips and some of them fairly uh, individually small projects i would want to give a public thanks to dan reed our maintenance director who actually engineered the, some of those things in the sense that they're small project you don't need a because of the size of the project, you don't have to have an engineer stamp on them, but somebody has to plan how to do it. You don't just call in the truck and pour in the concrete or whatever it may be. In the past, we've had to call uh, an architectural or engineering firm, even for something as simple as that, and uh, it's been uh, really, I think, very efficient to have it and cost-effective to have it do it, have him do those things. What is, in fact, however, uh, very obvious to me and I'm concerned about it, is that um, his talents and his abilities are certainly being drowned out by all the problems that we're, we're dealing with. I mean, it's just a totally kind of uh, overwhelming situation. However, that is moving along. We will have um, the, not all the projects are finished, and as soon as they are, we will give the board a cost uh, project by project basis of what we have been doing in that respect. With the loss of Shirley Willis, who's the chairman? We have, in fact, um, I'm not sure it's actually in the building yet, but what our uh, intention is to post that, you can call it as a stipend in position. We have had some conversation with it, with um, Gail Parker has agreed to chair the uh, meeting, to host the meeting uh, for the time being, whether or not she will um, actually be, that, that will work out, that that's something she's interested in, or something that goes through the process where you, aren't, uh, haven't determined that at this point, but she will take care of it temporarily. And Wayne, obviously, has been involved in the past and is, even though it's a 501, not strictly speaking, a special education situation, clearly he is also involved, particularly from a kind of a student parent point of view. So we're all right for now, although we will miss Shirley. She did a terrific job. What, in fact, Shirley was able to do for us was to put in place a baseline um, mandatory grievance procedure, the general outline of the duties of the committee, and to put in place at least the beginnings of a decision-making process. It's muddy because the law now, the ADA requires a committee to review things, but they're not necessarily the decision-makers. They are intended to be representatives of both the municipal and the school people as well as representatives from the school uh, administration and so forth. Uh, and parents and to uh, try to draw up what seem to be the priorities um, and then obviously it goes through both the school board and the town council as to decision making on how much funding will be committed to that so we're kind of working our way through all of that is this a federal law ada yeah okay yeah. it's just interesting that the drug-free schools grant is is set up on the same way. It has to be an advisory committee that yeah. has has really no authority to to spend, but they have to approve all yeah. spending. Yeah. It gets sometimes it's um, a little unclear exactly what the decision making process should be. I mean, I know we ran into that a bit. But we're, we're Anything else? 
Okay, the next item is unfinished business, and the only unfinished business is school board goals for the 1993-94 school year. Um, I put in your packet a summary that I hoped was capturing some of your comments at our August board meeting. And since it seemed to be an important issue to um, take these four major goals, promoting a successful building referendum, uh, improving parent school communication with emphasis on facilitating a climate of respect, continuing to develop a coherent curriculum, and developing opportunities to learn and apply the total quality process. Um, we felt that the next step would be to meet with administration. Um, frankly, of course, as soon as school opens, but with one thing and another, it's hard to find mutual time. I had suggested this Friday, but for a variety of reasons, that looks like it's not going to work out. My question to you, would the following Friday be acceptable, and what, what are the possibilities that the board could meet in a workshop session? I could meet the next Friday. I don't know what what day okay, is the following it? Friday. Pardon me. Twenty four. Yeah, what right. hours? Well, we meet at nine thirty to eleven thirty normally. Is that I can not do good? it. Hmm? Okay, Peter can do it. Charlie can do it. Beth, Mark. That's fine. Do you know? Rosemary. Okay. okay. Why don't Why don't we set it for nine thirty? Nine thirty. Nine thirty. The September twenty fourth. And that will be where? Where would we do that? We we'll can do it up, uh, upstairs, upstairs in the uh, Superintendent's Conference Room. We have okay. a blackboard, a whiteboard there, which makes it a nice, even though we like, we all kind of like 1226, when it comes to trying to actually get something worked on and work, use a board and so on, actually the room upstairs is very convenient. Now, does that, at this meeting, I assume, has to be posted and publicized like? Yeah, it's a, actually, it's a workshop. Uh, we'll, we'll post it as a workshop, the school board and administrators too. Anybody have anything to say about the goals, or shall we postpone it for that meeting? Okay, we'll move on to new business, and the first item is first reading of policies. Who's going to oversee the I would like to make a couple of comments first um, because we sort of ended the subcommittee discussion where we should have put since this will be new business. Um, I would like to bring the public's attention to two items in particular, and that's homework and the envelope. And uh, we will be searching for public, administrative, and staff input on these issues. And I would just like to um, let the public know early that we are discussing Excuse me. Uh, like the public know early that we are discussing a possible elimination of the honor roll, just as one of the options, and also a uh, administrative guideline review and policy review of uh, the homework uh, policy as written. And I think those will both uh, elicit a lot of public comment. Can I just ask a question? Do you think we should um, elicit comment besides tonight is through I, the schools or whatever? Because I agree with you. I think parents would be very interested in comment. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we need to communicate it uh, any way we can. And I was using this opportunity to start the discussion. Okay. Seeing that opportunity, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, and first, just to address the concept of the honor roll. The, in the policy uh, committee meeting, subcommittee meeting, this uh, um, policy was reviewed and there really was a significant amount of question as to its role, especially at the middle school level. Uh, I, I would agree, or my feelings on the subject are that we would probably be better off without honor students or honor roll at the middle school level. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. One of them is that the majority of middle schoolers, if I understand this correctly, who are eligible are actually on the honor roll. There are more students on the honor roll than who don't make the honor roll. And 60 plus percent students? Um, I, I did do the statistics and uh, I gave them to, uh, to you and you. I actually saw them a little bit later in the, uh, in the newsletter. I did not, however, commit them to memory because that was six months ago. But it, it, it was uh, 
between 7 and let's say 15 percent uh, high honors. That's right. And it was between 55 and 45 percent honors. And so it was, and again I'm speaking mostly from recollection, it was depending on the grade it was slightly more than uh, half on honors in some cases and slightly less than half on both types of honors, high honors right. and low. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, and the, the reason I did the calculations was that the kind of the, the word on the street was that everybody's basically on honor roll and therefore it means nothing. And when you analyze the numbers that really wasn't true. Now you could take a more conservative approach or more stringent approach and say well, only 2% should get high honors and another 10% get honors, and then that would really be a rigorous honor roll. But the one we have is as I described it, and it, we certainly should discuss it. One, whether we should have one, and two, whether that type of uh, percentage is appropriate for the message we're trying to send. Thank you, Peter. I, that's, those are close to what my recollections are, too, and I did not commit them to memory. Uh, but I know you did that work for us, and then we published it in our newsletter. Over the past several years, we've had several discussions in our faculty about the honor roll, and I think it's something we are very willing to look at um, and see what really is the purpose of it. How does that go along with what we're trying to do in the middle school? Is it really serving a purpose that we want to continue um, serving it in that way, or is there something else that we can do? So it's certainly something we are very willing to do. In fact, the sixth grade this year very much wanted to just not do it, and we talked about that we really needed to go through a process of getting some parent input and talking with the students. And then I became aware that the board was talking about it at a policy level and the sixth grade team is delighted because this might even be a quicker way to find an answer to their question. Nancy, the sixth grade isn't even addressed in the honor roll. The honor roll in the policy doesn't start till the seventh. Right, and I think when the policy was written, um, the middle school, it was one of those years, times when the middle school was either four through eight or five through eight. And the four through six, five through six students did not participate. The sixth grade began participating in the honor roll, I believe, during that short period of time that it was a six through eight middle school in, in our recent past. And there it began to look at if we're going to do something as a middle school, let's all do something as a middle school. When the fifth grade rejoined us last year, uh, we met and they decided as a team not to participate in the honor roll and we supported that as input from them. And then the sixth grade said, great, if they don't have to participate, maybe we'd like to look at not participating too. It is a question that we've also talked about throughout in our entire faculty. So I think five through eight is something we're very interested in looking at. And we as a faculty go out on a limb here and say, I don't, we would not miss it tremendously <laughs> if it was not there. Just to complete my thought, the, uh, I, my feeling is that although it is very important that we celebrate academic excellence, I'm not certain that the honor roll does that for two reasons. The one is the number, number issue that uh, if you're really looking to provide a standard bearer or a celebration of um, competition among ac in academia, it seems curious that over 50% of the class would be involved in receiving that. So there, there is a problem there. But also m my feeling is that this would t this continues to sometimes misplace the importance of academic achievement and equates uh, academic achievement with success in grades and again reinforces the concept that grades are important where what I would like to see is that we could somehow celebrate or acknowledge people who have demonstrated certain abilities so some type of demonstration project either through a written portfolio or art exhibitions those types of exhibitions of academic excellence the the one that comes to mind most readily was one that Gary record had put together for a competition of, of, of math uh, projects that students participated in it was an outstanding uh, show the children put a lot of work in it it was a lot of fun and uh, everybody left feeling a winner whether they had received an, an, an honorary uh, ribbon or whatever the title was. So I, I would very much be in favor of eliminating the honor roll at the middle school level and looking instead at celebrating academic achievement more based on real um, exhibition rather than on a grading system which is very difficult to control and probably gives some kids an un unfair advantage in terms of what they've been able to achieve uh, academically. Uh, I would concur with, with Mark's remarks. 
I have three children, uh, one who's always attained the honor roll, one who is always striving and is always kept off by one course, and it usually is the course that is a questionable, uh, 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 questionable curriculum, and yet keeps a child off who gets A's and B's because he gets a C plus. And I have another child who doesn't strive for the honor roll. So I have all gamuts, but the one I see suffering is the one that's always striving, and it's always something that keeps that particular student off the honor roll. And, it, and it's gone right into the high school. And the high school, it's due to the fact of scheduling. He may be in an honors course, but has no options to drop back down to a, a CP course. So again, even though he's struggling and doing his best, he's kept off. If you're going to do recognition, you need to do it. I think you should do it by grade point average. And that leads me to my other question. Why do we have two different grading systems, a grading system that stops at eighth grade and changes in the high school? I would like to know what that rationale is. Why, why the change in the grading systems and the grade points? What an A is in the high school and what an A is in the, in the eighth grade? I guess I, we were under the impression that um, they were the same, that the, the high school range doesn't go from 93 to 100. Yes. Is that, that that's what, what it is? That's what it is in the middle school, too, well, with like the to exception the, of grade five. Where that rationale came from, because that's not rationale that's consistent with college, or college that I I, 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 I don't, I, we could check out the history of it. I, I don't know. It's been that way for many, many years. And it's like the way that grades in the high school. I mean, mm -hmm. at what point is that for marketing purposes or is that for, I, I think you know? one of the things, um, our sixth grade team is very interested in working with one of the TQM groups that Connie's going to be working with because they have a question, but it's a question the entire middle school has. And I think this whole idea of looking at what the grade span is, an idea too that they also have of working in trimesters rather than in quarters because it would give us a longer time to do projects. We have talked about the exhibitions and looking at those instead of um, doing some different kinds of things with open houses. We've moved away from science fairs and science competitions. Even the conference we belong to in Triple C, we've moved away to that. And last year they all did a common experiment together and it was a very different kind of experience than they'd had before. Some of our fellow Triple C schools have moved to academic um, conventions instead of other things. And those are things we would like to look at too. So any discussion that you start at the board level I think the middle school faculty is very interested in participating in that. We're very interested to hear what families have to say about that. In the past, when we have talked about the honor roll, I will tell you there is one group that holds on to the honor roll, and that's the student group. Um, they have, some of them have used it very appropriately as a goal for themselves and a way to motivate themselves. And some of them have used it in other interesting motivational ways. But um, they have held on to that more tightly than probably any other group. But this is a discussion that I know our middle school faculty would be very interested in participating in. There's a lot of things that go along with middle school that conflict with our current grading pattern, with how many times we hand out grades, with some of the things, the honor roll and those things. So we are very open to that discussion. But I, I think that discussion has to include the high school because I think it's, it's a, again, a system-wide problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, um, could, can I can I just make a couple of comments? Um, I, I hear what you say about just going to the um, you know the performance mode, but what I remember discussing with a lot of teachers at the high school is that whole struggle of how to uh, fit a performance or look at a look at a paper and figure out what constitutes an A paper and what constitutes a B paper or what constitutes an A performance or a B performance and really develop models for, you know, consistent models that you can apply to show kids, you know, this is what, you know, if you're looking for an A, this is the kind of paper you have to show me um, to get an A. I, I think we're opening a can of worms right now if we start talking about, it almost sounds like we're talking about doing away with grades at, at some point. I don't think that's really in the cards right now. I mean, the reality of the world is right now that we have we grades, right? Yes, yes. and I, I would like to know from what historical context did we suddenly change to a different, why, did, why are we out of step with the world? That's a main aberration. Um, 
I've been in this area as a teacher or administrator for 30 years. That's what it's been. In, and I've heard that question from parents who moved in from away <laughs> for a long time. And I remember thinking, gee, what's the matter with you? You know, 93 is an A. If you, if you said but it at 90, colleges then within then Maine then don't use that. I, That's the 10, 10 point span. I teach on that level. I only go back 30 years. I think this probably <laughs> <laughs> preceded that. <laughs> I'm hearing, but I'm just, I, it's just a question no, that people have raised uh, in my experience over that span of time. And uh, we'll probably find, if we really could dig into it, that um, Miss Wormwood somewhere along the way established that is, is, and it's been institutionalized, but other than that, I don't know. Well, it, it, it just seems to me we can, we can make grades more appropriately reflect actual performance or actual excellence yeah. or, um, and, and I think we need to work on that and I think this whole issue also brings up you know what we hear about a lot which is you know grade grade inflation issues I know parents have talked to me actually just the other night one parent said to me why are non-academic courses you know counted in the honor roll and I do think that this is a little bit of a thorny issue without an easy answer that we should um, that we should work on and certainly get teacher and parent input. I would be very interested in hearing what people have to say on that before we make a decision at this level. Oh, One more. Charlie. Thing. You know, I don't support elimination of grades, but I would want to rely more on grade point average as a reflection of how a child is doing, not the number of A's their child got, not the number of B's. And I think that's the question. It's that competition. And some children are rewarded for that, for producing that kind of competition. And that's, that I know is quite widespread in this community and in other communities. The children are rewarded for the number of A's they get and the number of B's. And I'd rather see it expressed as a great point average. I hate to be on the left, but <laughs> the, I, I really think it, at that grade, at, at that grade level in the middle school, I really flinch at having students being concerned about their GPA and uh, kids asking, was this going to affect the type of college I get into? If they are going to have years to mess around with colleges and graduate schools and the concept of, of competing for fractions of GPAs at the middle school level really, I, I really have a difficult time with. I think that there, there, it is a can of worms and there are a lot of options. One of the things that I'm grateful for is anytime one of my children gets a C, I'm just like, all right, good job. I'm so grateful that the teacher dropped out a C and it's uncommon because A's are so common. The, um, I think that it is very much possible to demand academic excellence and not be tying it into a stress-related, um, grade-conscious, GPA-dominated scheme of evaluation. And uh, although I'm not supporting dropping grades altogether, I, especially at the middle school level, I'm very interested in trying to make the dominant theme achievement, the dominant theme academic excellence, and the competition is not among each other for honoraries at that level. The, the competition is among themselves. And so that it isn't that no grades means mediocre work. The teacher should still be giving clear feedback. This is inadequate work. But it doesn't have to be tied to a number. It doesn't have to be tied to a specific level. It has to be tied to work um, and then finally output levels on each student and make certain that they're held to accountable standards for each student and not into a competition in a giant pool of numbers and letters. I, I just have to add one more, and that is for the parents who don't understand what can happen with this whole honor roll system and the grading. There are students who are uh, very easy to understand systems, and we have some students who take five classes, which is the minimum required. They get all A's in them, and they end up very high in their class rank, which is their goal, taking CP as opposed to the more challenging honors classes, and th then leave here thinking that they've done a wonderful job with their uh, 96.4 acume. There are, and I've looked at the difference between the weighted grades and the unweighted grades at the high school, but just to let you know how this is much more than just an honor roll issue, it's, it becomes very complicated. Then there are other students who graduate 
taking as much as a year's worth of additional educational opportunities that our system offers. And they may not be as high uh, in the class rank. Their grades were not as high, but they learned a lot more. And I think that we need to really separate, uh, are we trying to have students learn as much as they can, or are we trying to allow them the opportunity to get the highest grades they can? The other issue is we have a tremendous amount of cheating that goes on, and the cheating is based around attainment of higher grades. And I think that any disincentive we have uh, to focus on um, the high grade and any incentive we have uh, to focus on learning uh, should be at least discussed openly. Peter? I'll try to make this <laughs> short. Uh, for those of you who are planning on coming to the 11th <laughs> <laughs> Finance <laughs> Committee, come at midnight. <laughs> this, this is a vast subject, and uh, I, I'm sort of, and I have, on my five years on the school board, I have uh, wanted to address the issue of uh, grades and what they mean and, and see some system-wide approach. And I don't think we could look at the honor roll, uh, judging from what you've all said, uh, outside of uh, you know, a system-wide review. You have to fit this into what's going on in the system. So my question, I'm not going to take a position on this. Uh, most of you probably know what my position is anyway. But how are we going to do this? Are we going to deal with this uh, uh, honor roll independently uh, at our next um, meeting or we can have a workshop. Uh, Connie knows. Connie. No, I don't know. I, don't <laughs> I, I think obviously it's an iceberg issue. I was just going to suggest that it's on here as one that needs input and we can discuss from a variety of points of view administratively. Perhaps this is a topic that you will really want to talk with you in your administrative workshop. Um, about do we tie it to something else so that it doesn't become just a simple, I think what you see in the in this concept of policy with honor roll, grading, assessment, you see a way in which schools have tended to see these things little water tank compartments when they are not. Those of you who were um, really tied into the discussions we had for the coalition last year, uh, that's Ted Sizer's coalition I'm, I'm talking about here. And the exhibitions and performances may hear some of the echoes of some of what he was talking about and some of what you're talking about. And just remember how hard it was to deal with public perception about what that means. It was not easy. People misread the, the, uh, the intent. Um, you know, it's um, clearly as a teacher, I, I think it's very offensive or very discouraging or very something, but not encouraging when children throw a paper on your desk and say there it's your problem you grade it I don't care whether you know it's not the learning issue it's that kind of thing they disassociate the the evaluation from any sense of what have I learned and another thing that is very discouraging is what do I have to do to get an A if there is any turnoff for learning it is what do I have to do to get an A and it breeds a mindset um, and I do believe that one of the fundamental themes of restructuring is trying to teach little children to see learning in a formal environment, such as what that's what going to school is supposed to do, um, as understanding oneself as a learner and understanding more and more how you can learn and that that is the issue, not what do I have to do to get an A, because that is allowing a finite limit on learning that is set up by somebody else to, uh, that actually diminishes what is learned rather than enhances what is learned. So it's tied to this issue, but it is not one that we're going to come to grips with easily. So we will try to come back administratively with some kind of framing of the issue, um, but don't expect us to have an answer. Well, I, frankly, I would like to see us have a workshop on this at some point because I do think it touches a lot of the issues we're dealing with, and I do think we need to have an opportunity um, uh, both to have the administrators and teachers talk to, to parents and us about it, but to also hear what parents have to say. Well, and maybe after the, uh, 
building referendum is over, we could deal we could we could deal with this because I do think it's an important issue and we brought up a whole lot of issues in relation to this and I do think they're middle school and high school they're actually you know system wide. Oh, they're system wide. Yeah. Um, again, and and maybe we could use this as a focus to talk about some of those things. How do you teach children how to go to school? And how, at the same time, do you deal with the reality that to get into colleges you need certain grades, and you know people focus on that? It's, mm -hmm. a, sure. it's a dilemma. Maybe this can help us wrestle with it. Maybe not. Um, could I make a suggestion? <laughs> yes. Because this is, you know, <laughs> it's creeping on. Um, the, the three policies that are listed here for first reading um, are really fairly simple. The chapter one parent involvement is a mandated. Policy that uh, we do receive Chapter One funds, and uh, it was missing from our policy book, so it was included as suggested new language when we did our policy book audit. Um, I should quickly remind you, if you're not aware, Chapter One funds come to districts based on a um, a financial need basis, which is roughly tied to how many free and reduced lunch camp. Uh, a particular district has. Um, this district does not receive a lot of Chapter 1 funds, um, but for the fact that we do, we are still required to have a policy for parental involvement. Um, I did review this briefly with Wayne, and he's prepared to answer any questions if you have. Um, the uh, Any questions on that? But I, and this, at first reading, obviously, we don't adopt them now. It's a matter if you have read these over, the three of them, that one. The second one, um, promotion and retention of students. The other second blue one, which the policy subcommittee basically left unchanged with uh, crossing out intellectually and putting academically in, as noted in your print. And the third one, student assessment, changing the word child to students. Um, if there is anything in those three policies that you wish the subcommittee to look at or the administration to look at, you might mention it, and that would constitute a first reading. Charlie? The, the first one, Chapter 1, Program Parent Involvement, the last paragraph about the end, the end of your report, who will have the responsibility? provide that board to the board and to the cha state chapter one officials that's Wayne uh, Wayne does Should in that fact, be stated in the policy or I uh, normally is a special ed director although in fact in some systems of course there is enough of a commitment so there's actually a director of chapter one in this district I don't think it's necessary necessary you know I mean this is a new policy correct mm -hmm. it's one you do not have in okay. the policy, but so we've never had that report apparently before. not and it is um, However, I remember this mandate coming out a few years ago, and it just simply has never, it was caught in the audit that you didn't have. That's all. Any other comments on, on this one? I, I have one. Do we do this? <laughs> do we have it? I mean, it's nice to have the policy. No, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Uh, chapter 1 has a, a fairly vast set of regulations, like every federal law. and. Um, there are several annual reports that we complete, send in in July. Uh, they're all on file. They are audited annually. Um, we gather statistical data on the student achievement. Um, this policy was established several years ago by the U.S. Office under Chapter 1, and the thrust behind it was that there are school systems, as I'm sure you know, which have vast uh, amounts of money and staffing in Chapter 1. We have one person. We have about twenty-three or four thousand dollars of income, and uh, it's a policy which is applied a little differently because we're small. Uh, we have a limited number of children, and so our parent involvement is much more individual with the instructor than it is gather this large building committee, which in fact is what most cities do. But we follow all these regulations and apply. I, I had no doubt that you followed the regulations. <laughs> I, I know. Okay. Anything else? We've got the language and promotion or retention is rather general. Under student assessment, the child's is circled. It was somebody. Student, students is in the side there. Okay, the, the suggested. The suggested change. from the policy subcommittee was to change child to student. 
They're not all controversial. No. <laughs> That's why we thought we would get them out of the way. <laughs> the controversial ones take a little longer. Right. Like several years. Well, the honorable one may take. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next item is uh, approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 1993-94 school year. Mm -hmm. And you do have in your packet, actually. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, you have actually one that just lists them, and then you have one that explains them. And I would also add to the list that you have um, one that we didn't have the figure, I guess, when we put this out. We also receive a drug-free grant. Uh, Lyle Kramer is the coordinator for that one. 8,937 was what we received this year. That is, we're currently working off that. And their timeline is somewhat different, so we'll be resubmitting that grant, uh, probably receiving about the same roughly $9,000. Um, this is, again, a uh, fiscal obligation for boards to take votes every year. You, you seem, we seem to do this in September. This is letting you know the, the uh, dollar amounts we receive and what they are, generally speaking, used for. We do keep track of these in separate accounts. Uh, we have um, the, um, in your monthly printouts, these are not in the general appropriation account. They are in separate accounts that follow us. I think you probably will. Do I hear a motion? I right. move. Peter I'll second. I, I uh, move that we authorize the Cape Elizabeth School Department to receive and expend the 1993-94 federal programs outlined in the uh, September 10th, 93 memo from the superintendent. Second. From Wayne Dorr, I beg your pardon. Okay. Peter seconded. Any discussion? Charlie? Under the drug-free grants, whenever we have to approve those funds, there is an oversight function by some um, advisory group. Who is going to take over that function? Well, uh, last year when the, um, just before the, the community, community team, team disbanded, they, they, they did in fact approve it. Um, what Wayne, I mean, what Lyle and I will be talking about is whether the newly formed coalition is the appropriate group. I would suggest that it probably will be. Uh, but I don't think we've made that decision, but we'll let you know when it comes around. I would love to go to that meeting when they discuss that, those funds. Okay. Other comments? Okay. All that favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, the next item is personnel request. First, we have two resignations. Resignation. You, you have letters in your packet, one from Donna Durham and another one from Shirley Willis, both in the Special Education Department. Um, both have taken positions in other systems. And actually, the other part of the personnel request, We have a list of replacements, including replacements for those two positions. We might as well move right on, I think, and and uh, we can take these kind of as a block, unless there's some separate questions. These are positions that are people who are already, of course, at this stage in the game um, working. Our school nurse at Pond Cove, part-time, Paula Borelli. Special Education, Pond Cove, half-time, Nancy Miles. Uh, we did include on this list the long-term substitute for kindergarten, even though she has not officially started her full duties, she has been in um, on a day-to-day -day basis just to get to know the students. Since it is over one semester, I'm putting it on your, um, your appointment list as a long-term sub. Jeannie Giles, grade eight, one-year position, Therese, Therese Romanski, in special education middle school, David Farrick. We also note two uh, additional assignments, special education Lynn Neeter, who was transferred from half-time Pond Cove to full-time middle school, and Margaret Welch, who last year was a half-time remedial reading teacher who also picked up one sixth grade gifted and talented class. This year is picking up uh, all of our fifth and sixth grade humanity strain for gifted and talented, as well as um, her additional half-time remedial reading. 
therefore she becomes a full-time teacher. And you do have some biographical information on people who are new to the system. Question? Yes, I have a question regarding the long-term sub. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has any value, um, but it's on the sheet, so I wanted to ask. Is that MS supposed to be an MA? Oh, it is. Okay. It's a BS, actually, is what it is. A BS? BS, yeah. Thank you. It's, yeah, that's okay. Cool. Do I, no, do I hear a motion? Charlie? I move that we accept the resignation of Donna A. Durham and Shirley Willis, and we accept the superintendent's nominations for new teachers 1993-94 school year as outlined, and staff changes. Second. Rosemary? Any, any discussion? All in favor? And you should have a yellow sheet which adds a couple that have come in after I think we sent out our original packet. <coughs> Additional athletic positions for the 93-94 school year. This is the assistant AD which was discussed a little earlier at middle school, Andy Strout. Seventh grade girls soccer, Joellen Rand. And seventh grade boys soccer, Bob Dahl. And then additional co-curricular positions for the 93-94 school year. Eighth grade team leader, Mike Madden, which is a change from what there had been before. And the policy debate coach, Dwight Ely. Do I hear a motion? Rosemary? Um, I'll move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for additional athletic positions and additional co-curricular position for the 1993-94 school year. Second. Okay, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, go into executive session for the purpose of discussion. I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? The Parliament of Georgia has declared a state of emergency in the country and suspended its own powers.